presents an unabridged recording of Wide Sargasso Sea. This performance is owned by Isis Publishing Limited. They say when trouble comes, close ranks, and so the white people did. But we were not in their ranks. The Jamaican ladies had never approved of my mother. Because she pretty like pretty self, Christophine said. She was my father's second wife. Far too young for him, they thought, and worse still, a Martinique girl. When I asked her why so few people came to see us, she told me that the road from Spanish Town to Colibri Estate, where we lived, was very bad, and that road repairing was now a thing of the past. My father, visitors, horses, feeling safe in bed, all belonged to the past. Another day I heard her talking to Mr. Luttrell, our neighbour and her only friend. Of course they have their own misfortunes. Still waiting for this compensation the English promised when the Emancipation Act was passed? Some will wait for a long time. How could she know that Mr. Luttrell would be the first who grew tired of waiting? One calm evening, he shot his dog, swam out to sea, and was gone for always. No agent came from England to look after his property. Nelson's Rest, it was called and strangers from Spanish town rode up to gossip and discuss the tragedy. Live at Nelson's rest, not for love or money. An unlucky place. Mr. Luttrell's house was left empty, shutters banging in the wind. Soon the black people said it was haunted, they wouldn't go near it. And no one came near us. I got used to a solitary life, but my mother still planned and hoped... Perhaps she had to hope every time she passed a looking-glass. She still rode about every morning, not caring that the black people stood about in groups to jeer at her, especially after her riding clothes grew shabby. They notice clothes. They know about money. Then one day, very early, I saw her horse lying down under the frangipani tree. I went up to him, but he was not sick. He was dead and his eyes were black with flies. I ran away and did not speak of it, for I thought if I told no one it might not be true. But later that day Godfrey found him. He had been poisoned. Now we are marooned, my mother said. What will become of us? Godfrey said, I can't watch the horse night and day. I too old now. When the old time come, let it go. No use to grab at it. The Lord make no distinction between black and white. Black and white the same for him. Rest yourself in peace, for the righteous are not forsaken. But she couldn't. She was young. How could she not try for all the things that had gone so suddenly, so without warning? You're blind when you want to be blind, she said ferociously. And you're deaf when you want to be deaf. The old hypocrite, she kept saying. He knew what they were going to do. The devil prints of this world, Godfrey said. But this world don't last so long for mortal man. She persuaded a Spanish town doctor to visit my younger brother Pierre, who staggered when he walked and couldn't speak distinctly. I don't know what the doctor told her or what she said to him, but he never came again, and after that she changed. Suddenly, not gradually. She grew thin and silent, and at last she refused to leave the house at all. Our garden was large and beautiful, as that garden in the Bible. The tree of life grew there. But it had gone wild. The paths were overgrown, and a smell of dead flowers mixed with the fresh living smell. Under the tree ferns, tall as forest tree ferns, the light was green. Orchids flourished out of reach for some reason not to be touched. One was snaky looking, another like an octopus with long thin brown tentacles bare of leaves hanging from a twisted root. Twice a year the octopus orchid flowered. Then not an inch of tentacle showed. 
It was a bell-shaped mass of white, mauve, deep purples, wonderful to see. The scent was very sweet and strong. I never went near it. All Culibri estate had gone wild like the garden, gone to bush. No more slavery. Why should anybody work? This never saddened me. I did not remember the place when it was prosperous. My mother usually walked up and down the glassy, a paved roofed-in terrace which ran the length of the house and sloped upwards to a clump of bamboos. Standing by the bamboos, she had a clear view to the sea, but anyone passing could stare at her. They stared. Sometimes they laughed. Long after the sound was far away and faint, she kept her eyes shut and her hands clenched. A frown came between her black eyebrows. Deep. It might have been cut with a knife. I hated this frown, and once I touched her forehead, trying to smooth it. But she pushed me away. Not roughly, but calmly. Coldly. Without a word. As if she had decided, once and for all, that I was useless to her. She wanted to sit with Pierre, or walk where she pleased without being pestered. She wanted peace and quiet. I was old enough to look after myself. Oh, let me alone, she would say. Let me alone. And after I knew that she talked aloud to herself, I was a little afraid of her. So I spent most of my time in the kitchen, which was in an outbuilding some way off. Christophine slept in the little room next to it. When evening came, she sang to me if she was in the mood. I couldn't always understand her patois songs. She also came from Martinique. But she taught me the one that meant the little ones grow old, the children leave us, will they come back? And the one about the cedar tree flowers, which only last for a day. The music was gay, but the words were sad, and her voice often quavered and broke on the high note. Adieu. Not adieu as we say it, but adieu, which made more sense after all. The loving man was lonely, the girl was deserted, the children never came back. Adieu. Her songs were not like Jamaican songs, and she was not like the other women. She was much blacker, blue-black, with a thin face and straight features. She wore a black dress, heavy gold earrings, and a yellow handkerchief, carefully tied with the two high points in front. No other Negro woman wore black, or tied her handkerchief Martinique fashion. She had a quiet voice, and a quiet laugh, when she did laugh. And though she could speak good English if she wanted to, and French as well as Patois, she took care to talk as they talked. But they would have nothing to do with her. And she never saw her son, who worked in Spanish town. She had only one friend, a woman called Mayotte, and Mayotte was not a Jamaican. The girls from the bayside who sometimes helped with the washing and cleaning were terrified of her. That, I soon discovered, was why they came at all, for she never paid them. Yet they brought presents of fruit and vegetables, and after dark I often heard low voices from the kitchen. So I asked about Christophine. Was she very old? Had she always been with us? She was your father's wedding present to me, one of his presents. He thought I would be pleased with a Martinique girl. I don't know how old she was when they brought her to Jamaica, quite young. I don't know how old she is now. Does it matter? Why do you pester and bother me about all these things that happened long ago? Christophine stayed with me because she wanted to stay. She had her own very good reasons, you may be sure. I dare say we would have died if she'd turned against us, and that would have been a better fate. To die and be forgotten and at peace. Not to know that one is abandoned, lied about, helpless. All the ones who died, who says a good word for them now? Godfrey stayed too, I said, and Sass. 
They stayed, she said angrily, because they wanted somewhere to sleep and something to eat. That boy sass. When his mother pranced off and left him here, a great deal she cared. Why, he was a little skeleton. Now he's growing into a big, strong boy, and away he goes. We shan't see him again. Godfrey is a rascal. These new ones aren't too kind to old people, and he knows it. That's why he stays. Doesn't do a thing, but eats enough for a couple of horses. Pretends he's deaf. He isn't deaf. He doesn't want to hear. What a devil he is. Why don't you tell him to find somewhere else to live? I said, and she laughed. He wouldn't go. He'd probably try to force us out. I've learned to let sleeping curs lie, she said. Would Christophine go if you told her to, I thought. But I didn't say it. I was afraid to say it. It was too hot that afternoon. I could see the beads of perspiration on her upper lip and the dark circles under her eyes. I started to fan her, but she turned her head away. She might rest if I left her alone, she said. Once I would have gone back quietly to watch her asleep on the blue sofa. Once I made excuses to be near her when she brushed her hair, a soft black cloak to cover me, hide me, keep me safe. But not any longer, not any more. These were all the people in my life, my mother and Pierre, Christophine, Godfrey, and Sass, who had left us. I never looked at any strange Negro. They hated us. They called us white cockroaches. Let sleeping dogs lie. One day, a little girl followed me, singing, Go away, white cockroach, go away, go away. I walked fast, but she walked faster. White cockroach, go away, go away. Nobody want you, go away. When I was safely home, I sat close to the old wall at the end of the garden. It was covered with green moss, soft as velvet, and I never wanted to move again. Everything would be worse if I moved. Christophine found me there when it was nearly dark, and I was so stiff she had to help me to get up. She said nothing, but next morning Tia was in the kitchen with her mother Mayotte, Christophine's friend. Soon Tia was my friend, and I met her nearly every morning at the turn of the road to the river. Sometimes we left the bathing pool at midday, sometimes we stayed till late afternoon. Then Tia would light a fire. Fires always lit for her. Sharp stones did not hurt her bare feet, I never saw her cry. We boiled green bananas in an old iron pot and ate them with our fingers out of a calabash. And after we had eaten, she slept at once. I could not sleep, but I wasn't quite awake as I lay in the shade looking at the pool, deep and dark green under the trees, brown green if it had rained, but a bright sparkling green in the sun. The water was so clear that you could see the pebbles at the bottom of the shallow part, blue and white and striped red, very pretty. Late or early, we parted at the turn of the road. My mother never asked me where I had been or what I had done. Christophine had given me some new pennies, which I kept in the pocket of my dress. They dropped out one morning, so I put them on a stone. They shone like gold in the sun, and Tia stared. She had small eyes, very black, set deep in her head. Then... She bet me three of the pennies that I couldn't turn a somersault under water. Like you say you can. Of course I can. I never see you do it, she said. Only talk. Bet you all the money I can, I said. But after one somersault, I still turned and came up choking. Tia laughed and told me that it certainly looked like I drowned dead that time. Then she picked up the money. I did do it, I said when I could speak, but she shook her head. 
I hadn't done it good, and besides, pennies didn't buy much. Why did I look at her like that? Keep them then, you cheating nigger, I said, for I was tired, and the water I had swallowed made me feel sick. I can get more if I want to. That's not what she hear, she said. She hear all we poor like beggar. We ate salt fish, no money for fresh fish. That old house so leaky, you run with calabash to catch water when it rain. Plenty white people in Jamaica, real white people. They got gold money. They didn't look at us. Nobody see them come near us. Old time white people, nothing but white nigger now. And black nigger better than white nigger. I wrapped myself in my torn towel and sat on a stone with my back to her, shivering cold. But the sun couldn't warm me. I wanted to go home. I looked round and Tia had gone. I searched for a long time before I could believe that she had taken my dress. Not my underclothes, she never wore any, but my dress, starched, ironed, cleaned that morning. She had left me hers, and I put it on at last and walked home in the blazing sun, feeling sick, hating her. I planned to get round the back of the house to the kitchen, but passing the stables, I stopped to stare at three strange horses, and my mother saw me and called. She was on the glassy, with two young ladies and a gentleman. Visitors! I dragged up the steps unwillingly. I had longed for visitors once, but that was years ago. They were very beautiful, I thought, and they wore such beautiful clothes that I looked away, down at the flagstones, and when they laughed, the gentlemen laughed the loudest, I ran into the house, into my bedroom. There I stood with my back against the door, and I could feel my heart all through me. I heard them talking, and I heard them leave. I came out of my room, and my mother was sitting on the blue sofa. She looked at me for some time before she said that I had behaved very oddly. My dress was even dirtier than usual. It's Tia's dress. But why are you wearing Tia's dress? Tia? Which one of them is Tia? Christophine, who had been in the pantry listening, came at once and was told to find a clean dress for me. Throw away that thing. Burn it. Then they quarrelled. Christophine said I had no clean dress. She got two dresses, wash and wear. You want clean dress to drop from heaven. Some people crazy in truth. She must have another dress, said my mother, somewhere. But Christophine told her loudly that it's shameful. She run wild, she grow up worthless, and nobody care. My mother walked over to the window. Marooned, said her straight narrow back her carefully coiled hair, marooned. She has an old muslin dress. Find that. While Christophine scrubbed my face and tied my plaits with a fresh piece of string, she told me that those were the new people at Nelson's Rest. They called themselves Luttrell, but English or not English, they were not like old Mr. Luttrell. All Mr. Luttrell spit in their face if he see how they look at you. Trouble walk into the house this day. Trouble walk in. The old muslin dress was found, and it tore as I forced it on. She didn't notice. No more slavery. She had to laugh. These new ones have the letter of the law. Same thing. They got magistrate, they got fine, they got jailhouse and chain gang, they got tread machine to mash up people's feet. New ones worse than old ones, more cunning, that's all. All that evening my mother didn't speak to me or look at me, and I thought, 
she's ashamed of me. What Tia said is true. I went to bed early and slept at once. I dreamed that I was walking in the forest, not alone. Someone who hated me was with me, out of sight. I could hear heavy footsteps coming closer, and though I struggled and screamed, I could not move. I woke, crying. The covering sheet was on the floor, and my mother was looking down at me. Did you have a nightmare? Yes. A bad dream. She sighed and covered me up. You were making such a noise. I must go to Pierre. You frightened him. I lay thinking. I am safe. There is the corner of the bedroom door and the friendly furniture. There is the tree of life in the garden and the wall green with moss. The barrier of the cliffs and the high mountains and the barrier of the sea. I am safe. I am safe from strangers. The light of the candle in Pierre's room was still there when I slept again. I woke next morning, knowing that nothing would be the same. It would change and go on changing. I don't know how she got money to buy the white muslin and the pink. Yards of muslin. She may have sold her last ring, for there was one left. I saw it in her jewel box. That and a locket with a shamrock inside. They were mending and sewing first thing in the morning and still sewing when I went to bed. In a week, she had a new dress, and so had I. The laterals lent her a horse, and she would ride off very early and not come back till late next day, tired out because she had been to a dance or a moonlight picnic. She was gay and laughing, younger than I had ever seen her and the house was sad when she had gone. So I too left it and stayed away till dark. I was never long at the bathing pool. I never met Tia. I took another road, past the old sugar works and the water wheel that had not turned for years. I went to parts of Colibri that I had not seen, where there was no road, no path, no track. And if the razor grass cut my legs and arms, I would think... It's better than people. Black ants or red ones? Tall nests swarming with white ants? Rain that soaked me to the skin? Once I saw a snake. All better than people. Better, better, better than people. Watching the red and yellow flowers in the sun, thinking of nothing, it was as if a door opened and I was somewhere else, something else, not myself any longer. I knew the time of day, when, though it is hot and blue and there are no clouds, the sky can have a very black look. I was bridesmaid when my mother married Mr. Mason in Spanish town. Christophine curled my hair. I carried a bouquet, and everything I wore was new even my beautiful slippers. But their eyes slid away from my hating face. I had heard what all these smooth, smiling people said about her when she was not listening and they did not guess I was. Hiding from them in the garden when they visited Culibri, I listened. A fantastic marriage and he'll regret it. Why should a very wealthy man who could take his pick of all girls in the West Indies, and many in England too, probably. Why, probably? The other voice said, Certainly. Then, why should he marry a widow without a penny to her name and Culibri a wreck of a place? Emancipation troubles killed old Cosway. Nonsense. The estate was going downhill for years before that. He drank himself to death. Many's the time when... Well... And all those women. She never did anything to stop him. She encouraged him. Presents and smiles for the bastards every Christmas. Old customs. Some old customs are better dead and buried. Her new husband will have to spend a pretty penny before the house is fit to live in. Leaks like a sieve. 
What about the stables and the coach house? Dark as pitch, and the servants' quarters and the six-foot snake I saw with my own eyes curled up on the privy seat last time I was here. Alarmed, I screamed. Then that horrible old man she harbours came along, doubled up with laughter. As for those two children, the boy an idiot kept out of sight and mind, and the girl going the same way, in my opinion. A lowering expression. Oh, I agree, the other one said. But Annette is such a pretty woman, and what a dancer. Reminds me of that song, Light as Cotton Blossom on the Something Breeze, or, or is it Air? I forget. Yes, what a dancer. That night when they came home from their honeymoon in Trinidad, and they danced on the glassy to no music, there was no need for music when she danced. They stopped and she leaned backwards over his arm, down till her black hair touched the flagstones, still down, down. Then, up again in a flash, laughing, she made it look so easy as if anyone could do it, and he kissed her, a long kiss. I was there that time too, but they had forgotten me, and soon I wasn't thinking of them. I was remembering that woman saying, Dance? He didn't come to the West Indies to dance. He came to make money, as they all do. Some of the bigger states are going cheap, and one unfortunate's loss is always a clever man's gain. No, the whole thing is a mystery. It's evidently useful to keep a Martinique Obe woman on the premises. She meant Christophine. She said it mockingly, not meaning it. But soon other people were saying it, and meaning it. While the repairs were being done, and they were in Trinidad, Pierre and I stayed with Aunt Cora in Spanish town. Mr. Mason did not approve of Aunt Cora, an ex-slave owner who had escaped misery, a flyer in the face of Providence. Why did she do nothing to help you? I told him that her husband was English and didn't like us, and he said, Nonsense. It isn't nonsense. They lived in England, and he was angry if she wrote to us. He hated the West Indies. When he died not long ago, she came home. Before that, what could she do? She wasn't rich. That's her story. I don't believe it. A frivolous woman. In your mother's place, I'd resent her behaviour. None of you understand about us, I thought. Colibri looked the same when I saw it again. Although it was clean and tidy, no grass between the flagstones, no leaks. But it didn't feel the same. Sass had come back, and I was glad. They can smell money, somebody said. Mr. Mason engaged new servants. I didn't like any of them, excepting Manny, the groom. It was their talk about Christophine that changed Colibri. Not the repairs or the new furniture or the strange faces. Their talk about Christophine and Obe changed it. I knew her room so well. The pictures of the Holy Family and the prayer for a happy death. She had a bright patchwork counterpane, a broken-down press for her clothes, and my mother had given her an old rocking chair. Yet one day when I was waiting there, I was suddenly very much afraid. The door was open to the sunlight. Someone was whistling near the stables. But I was afraid. I was certain that hidden in the room, behind the old black press, there was a dead man's dried hand, white chicken feathers, a cock with its throat cut, dying slowly, slowly. Drop by drop, the blood was falling into a red basin, and I imagined I could hear it. No one had ever spoken to me about Obe, but I knew what I would find if I dared to look. Then Christophine came in, smiling and pleased to see me. Nothing alarming ever happened, and I forgot, or told myself I had forgotten. Mr. Mason would laugh if he knew how frightened I had been. He would laugh even louder than he did when my mother told him that she wished to leave Culibri. 
This began when they had been married for over a year. They always said the same things, and I seldom listened to the argument now. I knew that we were hated, but to go away? For once I agreed with my stepfather. That was not possible. You must have some reason, he would say, and she would answer. I need a change. Or, we could visit Richard. Richard, Mr. Mason's son by his first marriage, was at school in Barbados. He was going to England soon, and we had seen very little of him. An agent could look after this place, for the time being. The people here hate us. They certainly hate me. Straight out, she said that one day. And it was then he laughed so heartily. Annette, be reasonable. You were the widow of a slave owner, the daughter of a slave owner, and you'd been living here alone with two children for nearly five years when we met. Things were at their worst then. But you were never molested, never harmed. How do you know that I was not harmed? She said. We were so poor then, she told him. We were something to laugh at. But we are not poor now, she said. You are not a poor man. Do you suppose that they don't know all about your estate in Trinidad and the Antigua property? They talk about us without stopping. They invent stories about you and lies about me. They try to find out what we eat every day. They are curious. It's natural enough. You've lived alone far too long, Annette. You imagine enmity that doesn't exist. Always one extreme or the other. Didn't you fly at me like a little wildcat when I said nigger? Not nigger, nor even negro. Black people, I must say. You don't like or even recognize the good in them, she said. And you won't believe in the other side. They're too damn lazy to be dangerous, said Mr. Mason. I know that. They are more alive than you are, lazy or not, and they can be dangerous and cruel for reasons you wouldn't understand. No, I don't understand, Mr. Mason always said. I don't understand at all. But she'd speak about going away again, persistently, angrily, Mr. Mason pulled up near the empty huts on our way home that evening. All gone to one of those dances, he said, young and old. How deserted the place looks. We'll hear the drums if there is a dance. I hoped he'd ride on quickly, but he stayed by the huts to watch the sun go down. The sky and the sea were on fire when we left Bertrand Bay at last. From a long way off I saw the shadow of our house, high up on its stone foundations. There was a smell of ferns and river water, and I felt safe again, as if I was one of the righteous. Godfrey said that we were not righteous. One day when he was drunk, he told me that we were all damned and no use praying. They've chosen a very hot night for the dance, Mr. Mason said, and Aunt Cora came on to the glassy. What dance? Where? There's some festivity in the neighbourhood. The huts were abandoned. A wedding, perhaps? Not a wedding, I said. There is never a wedding. He frowned at me, but Aunt Cora smiled. When they had gone indoors, I leaned my arms on the cool, glassy railings and thought that I would never like him very much. I still called him Mr. Mason in my head. Good night, white peppy, I said one evening, and he was not vexed, he laughed. In some ways it was better before he came, though he'd rescued us from poverty and misery. Only just in time, too. The black people did not hate us quite so much when we were poor. We were white, but we had not escaped, and soon we would be dead, for we had no money left. What was there to hate? Now it had started up again, and worse than before. 
My mother knows, but she can't make him believe it. I wish I could tell him that out here is not at all like English people think it is. I wish... I could hear them talking, and Aunt Cora's laugh. I was glad she was staying with us. And I could hear the bamboos shiver and creak, though there was no wind. It had been hot and still and dry for days. The colours had gone from the sky. The light was blue and could not last long. The glassy was not a good place when night was coming, Christophine said. As I went indoors, my mother was talking in an excited voice. Very well. As you refuse to consider it, I will go and take Pierre with me. You won't object to that, I hope? You are perfectly right, Annette, said Aunt Cora, and that did surprise me. She seldom spoke when they argued. Mr. Mason also seemed surprised and not at all pleased. You talk so wildly, he said, and you are so mistaken. Of course you can get away for a change if you wish it, I promise you. You have promised that before, she said. You don't keep your promises. He sighed. I feel very well here. However, we'll arrange something. Quite soon. I will not stay at Colibri any longer, my mother said. It is not safe. It is not safe for Pierre. Aunt Cora nodded. As it was late, I yet with them, instead of by myself as usual. Myra, one of the new servants, was standing by the sideboard, waiting to change the plates. We ate English food now, beef and mutton, pies and puddings. I was glad to be like an English girl, but I missed the taste of Christophine's cooking. My stepfather talked about a plan to import labourers, coolies as he called them, from the East Indies. When Myra had gone out, Aunt Cora said, I shouldn't discuss that if I were you. Myra is listening. But the people here won't work. They don't want to work. Look at this place. It's enough to break your heart. Hearts have been broken, she said. Be sure of that. I suppose you all know what you are doing. Do you mean to say... I said nothing, except that it would be wiser not to tell that woman your plans. Necessary and merciful, no doubt. I don't trust her. Live here most of your life and know nothing about the people? It's astonishing. They are children. They wouldn't hurt a fly. Unhappily, children do hurt flies, said Aunt Cora. Myra came in again, looking mournful as she always did, though she smiled when she talked about hell. Everyone went to hell, she told me. You had to belong to her sect to be saved, and even then, just as well not to be too sure. She had thin arms and big hands and feet, and the handkerchief she wore round her head was always white, never striped or a gay colour. So I looked away from her at my favourite picture, the miller's daughter. A lovely English girl with brown curls and blue eyes and a dress slipping off her shoulders. Then I looked across the white tablecloth and the vase of yellow roses at Mr. Mason, so sure of himself, so without a doubt English, and at my mother, so without a doubt not English, but no white nigger either, not my mother. Never had been, never could be. Yes, she would have died, I thought, if she had not met him. And for the first time I was grateful and liked him. There are more ways than one of being happy. Better perhaps to be peaceful and contented and protected, as I feel now. Peaceful for years and long years, and afterwards... I may be saved, whatever Myra says. When I asked Christophine what happened when you died, she said, You want to know too much? 
I remembered to kiss my stepfather goodnight. Once Aunt Cora had told me, He is very hurt because you never kiss him. He does not look hurt, I argued. Great mistake to go by looks, she said, one way or the other. I went into Pierre's room, which was next to mine, the last one in the house. The bamboos were outside his window. You could almost touch them. He still had a crib, and he slept more and more, nearly all the time. He was so thin that I could lift him easily. Mr. Mason had promised to take him to England later on. There he would be cured, made like other people. And how will you like that? I thought as I kissed him. How will you like being made exactly like other people? He looked happy asleep. But that will be later on. Later on. Sleep now. It was then I heard the bamboos creak again and a sound like whispering. I forced myself to look out of the window. There was a full moon, but I saw nobody, nothing but shadows. I left a light on the chair by my bed and waited for Christophine, for I liked to see her last thing. But she did not come, and as the candle burned down, the safe, peaceful feeling left me. I wished I had a big Cuban dog to lie by my bed and protect me. I wished I had not heard a noise by the bamboo clump. Or that I were very young again, for then I believed in my stick. It was not a stick, but a long narrow piece of wood with two nails sticking out at the end, a shingle perhaps. I picked it up soon after they killed our horse, and I thought, I can fight with this. If the worst comes to the worst, I can fight to the end, though the best ones fall. And that is another song. Christophine knocked the nails out, but she let me keep the shingle, and I grew very fond of it. I believed that no one could harm me when it was near me. To lose it would be a great misfortune. All this was long ago, when I was still babyish, and sure that everything was alive, not only the river or the rain, but chairs, looking-glasses, cups, saucers, everything. I woke up, and it was still night. And my mother was there. She said, Get up and dress yourself and come downstairs quickly. She was dressed, but she had not put up her hair and one of her plaits was loose. Quickly, she said again. Then she went into Pierre's room next door. I heard her speak to Myra and I heard Myra answer her. I lay there, half asleep, looking at the lighted candle on the chest of drawers, till I heard a noise as though a chair had fallen over in the little room. Then I got up and dressed. The house was on different levels. There were three steps down from my bedroom and Pierre's to the dining room, and then three steps from the dining room to the rest of the house, which we called downstairs. The folding doors of the dining room were not shut, and I could see that the big drawing room was full of people. Mr. Mason, my mother, Christophine, and Manny, and Sass. Aunt Cora was sitting on the blue sofa in the corner now, wearing a black silk dress. Her ringlets were carefully arranged. She looked very haughty, I thought. But Godfrey was not there, or Myra, or the cook, or any of the others. There is no reason to be alarmed, my stepfather was saying as I came in. A handful of drunken negroes. He opened the door leading to the glassy and walked out. What's all this? he shouted. What do you want? A horrible noise swelled up, like animals howling, but worse. We heard stones falling onto the glassy. He was pale when he came in again, but he tried to smile as he shut and bolted the door. More of them than I thought, and in a nasty mood, too. They'll repent in the morning. I foresee gifts of tamarinds in syrup and ginger sweets tomorrow. Tomorrow will be too late, said Aunt Cora. Too late for ginger sweets or anything else. My mother was not listening to either of them. She said, 
Pierre is asleep, and Myra is with him. I thought it better to leave him in his own room, away from this horrible noise. I don't know. Perhaps... She was twisting her hands together. Her wedding ring fell off and rolled into a corner near the steps. My stepfather and Manny both stooped for it. Then Manny straightened up and said, Oh, my God! They get at the back. They set fire to the back of the house. He pointed to my bedroom door, which I had shut after me, and smoke was rolling out from underneath. I did not see my mother move. She was so quick. She opened the door of my room, and then again I did not see her, nothing but smoke. Manny ran after her. So did Mr. Mason, but more slowly. Aunt Cora put her arms round me. She said, Don't be afraid. You are quite safe. We are all quite safe. Just for a moment I shut my eyes and rested my head against her shoulder. She smelled of vanilla, I remember. Then there was another smell of burned hair, and I looked and my mother was in the room, carrying Pierre. It was her loose hair that had burned and was smelling like that. I thought, Pierre is dead. He looked dead. He was white, and he did not make a sound, but his head hung back over her arm as if he had no life at all, and his eyes were rolled up so that you only saw the whites. My stepfather said, Annette, you're hurt, your hands. But she did not even look at him. His crib was on fire, she said to Aunt Cora. The little room is on fire, and Myra was not there. She's gone. She was not there. That does not surprise me at all, said Aunt Cora. She laid Pierre on the sofa, bent over him, then lifted up her skirt, stepped out of her white petticoat, and began to tear it into strips. She left him. She ran away and left him alone to die, said my mother, still whispering. So it was all the more dreadful when she began to scream abuse at Mr. Mason, calling him a fool, a cruel, stupid fool. I told you, she said. I told you what would happen again and again. Her voice broke, but still she screamed. You would not listen. You sneered at me, you grinning hypocrite. You ought not to live either. You know so much, don't you? Why don't you go out and ask them to let you go? Say how innocent you are. Say you have always trusted them. I was so shocked that everything was confused, and it happened quickly. I saw Manny and Sass staggering along with two large earthenware jars of water which were kept in the pantry. They threw the water into the bedroom, and it made a black pool on the floor, but the smoke rolled over the pool. Then Christophine, who had run into my mother's bedroom for the picture there, came back and spoke to my aunt. "'It seems they have fired the other side of the house,' said Aunt Cora. "'They must have climbed that tree outside. This place is going to burn like tinder, and there is nothing we can do to stop it. The sooner we get out, the better.' Manny said to the boy, you frighten? Sass shook his head. Then come on, said Manny. Out of my way, he said, and pushed Mr. Mason aside. Narrow wooden stairs led down from the pantry to the outbuildings, the kitchen, the servants' rooms, the stables. That was where they were going. Take the child, Aunt Cora told Christophine, and come. It was very hot on the glassy, too. They roared as we came out, and there was another roar behind us. I had not seen any flames, only smoke and sparks, but now I saw tall flames shooting up to the sky, for the bamboos had caught. There were some tree ferns near, green and damp. One of those was smouldering too. Come quickly, said Aunt Cora, and she went first, holding my hand. Christophine followed, carrying Pierre, and they were quite silent as we went down the glassy steps. But when I looked round for my mother, I saw that Mr. Mason, his face crimson with heat, seemed to be dragging her along, and she was holding back, struggling. I heard him say, It's impossible! Too late now! Wants a jewel case? Aunt Cora said. Jewel case? Nothing so sensible! bawled Mr. Mason. She wanted to go back for a damn parrot! I won't allow it! She did not answer only fought him silently, twisting like a cat and showing her teeth. Our parrot was called Coco, a green parrot. He didn't talk very well. He could say, Kiela, Kiela, 
and answer himself, Chekuko, Chekuko. After Mr. Mason clipped his wings, he grew very bad-tempered. And though he would sit quietly on my mother's shoulder, he darted at everyone who came near her and pecked their feet. Annette, said Aunt Cora, they are laughing at you. Do not allow them to laugh at you. She stopped fighting then, and he half supported, half pulled her after us, cursing loudly. Still, they were quiet, and there were so many of them, I could hardly see any grass or trees. There must have been many of the Bay people, but I recognized no one. They all looked the same. It was the same face repeated over and over, eyes gleaming, mouth half open to shout. We were past the mounting stone when they saw Manny driving the carriage round the corner. Sass followed, riding one horse and leading another. There was a lady's saddle on the one he was leading. Somebody yelled, But look, the black Englishman! Look, the white nigger! And then they were all yelling, Look, the white niggers! Look, the damn white niggers! A stone just missed Manny's head, and he cursed back at them, and they cleared away from the rearing frightened horses. Come on, for God's sake, said Mr. Mason. Get to the carriage, get to the horses. But we could not move, for they pressed too close round us. Some of them were laughing and waving sticks. Some of the ones at the back were carrying flambeaux, and it was light as day. Aunt Cora held my hand very tightly, and her lips moved, but I could not hear because of the noise. And I was afraid, because I knew that the ones who laughed would be the worse. I shut my eyes and waited. Mr. Mason stopped swearing and began to pray in a loud, pious voice. The prayer ended. May Almighty God defend us. And God, who is indeed mysterious, who had made no sign when they burned Pierre as he slept, not a clap of thunder, not a flash of lightning, mysterious God heard Mr. Mason at once and answered him. The yells stopped. I opened my eyes. Everybody was looking up and pointing at Coco on the glassy railings with his feathers alight. He made an effort to fly down, but his clipped wings failed him, and he fell screeching. He was all on fire. I began to cry. Don't look, said Aunt Cora. Don't look. She stooped and put her arms round me, and I hid my face, but I could feel that they were not so near. I heard someone say something about bad luck, and remembered that it was very unlucky to kill a parrot or even to see a parrot die. They began to go then, quickly, silently, and those that were left drew aside and watched us as we trailed across the grass. They were not laughing any more. Get to the carriage! Get to the carriage! said Mr. Mason. Hurry! He went first, holding my mother's arm, then Christophine carrying Pierre, and Aunt Cora was last, still with my hand in hers. None of us looked back. Manny had stopped the horses at the bend of the cobblestone road, and as we got closer we heard him shout, What all you are, eh, brute beasts? He was speaking to a group of men and a few women who were standing round the carriage. A coloured man with a machete in his hand was holding the bridle, I did not see Sass or the other two horses. Get in, said Mr. Mason. Take no notice of him. Get in. The man with the machete said no. We would go to police and tell a lot of damn lies. A woman said to let us go. All this an accident and they had plenty witness. Myra, she witnessed for us. Shut your mouth. The man said, You mash, centipede, mash it. Leave one little piece and it grow again. What do you think police believe, eh? You are the white nigger. Mr. Mason stared at him. He seemed not frightened, but too astounded to speak. Manny took up the carriage whip, but one of the blacker men wrenched it out of his hand 
snapped it over his knee, and threw it away. Run away, black Englishman, like the boy Ron. Hide in the bushes, it better for you. It was Aunt Cora who stepped forward and said, The little boy is very badly hurt. He will die if we cannot get help for him. The man said, So, black and white, they burn the same, eh? They do, she said, here and hereafter, as you will find out very shortly. He let the bridle go and thrust his face close to hers. He'd throw her on the fire, he said, if she put bad luck on him. Old White Jumby, he called her, but she did not move an inch. She looked straight into his eyes and threatened him with eternal fire in a calm voice. And never a drop of sangaree to cool your burning tongue, she said. He cursed her again, but he backed away. Now get in, said Mr. Mason. You, Christophine, get in with the child. Christophine got in. Now you he said to my mother. But she had turned and was looking back at the house, and when he put his hand on her arm, she screamed. One woman said she only came to see what happened. Another woman began to cry. The man with the cutlass said, You cry for her when she ever cry for you. Tell me that. But now I turned too. The house was burning, the yellow-red sky was like sunset, and I knew that I would never see Colibri again. Nothing would be left. The golden ferns and the silver ferns, the orchids, the ginger lilies and the roses, the rocking chairs and the blue sofa, the jasmine and the honeysuckle, and the picture of the miller's daughter. When they had finished there would be nothing left but blackened walls and the mounting stone. That was always left. That could not be stolen or burned. Then, not so far off, I saw Tia and her mother, and I ran to her, for she was all that was left of my life as it had been. We had eaten the same food, slept side by side, bathed in the same river. As I ran, I thought, I will live with Tia, and I will be like her, not to leave Colibri, not to go, not... When I was close, I saw the jagged stone in her hand, but I did not see her throw it. I did not feel it either, only something wet running down my face. I looked at her, and I saw her face crumple up as she began to cry. We stared at each other, blood on my face, tears on hers. It was as if I saw myself, like in a looking-glass. I saw my plaid tied with red ribbon when I got up, I said, in the chest of drawers. I thought it was a snake. Your hair had to be cut. You've been very ill, my darling, said Aunt Cora. But you are safe with me now. We are all safe, as I told you we would be. You must stay in bed, though. Why are you wandering about the room? Your hair will grow again, she said, longer and thicker. But darker, I said. Why not darker? She picked me up, and I was glad to feel the soft mattress, and glad to be covered with a cool sheet. It's time for your arrow root she said, and went out. When that was finished, she took the cup away and stood looking down at me. I got up because I wanted to know where I was. And you do know, don't you? she said in an anxious voice. Of course, but how did I get to your house? The Luttrells were very good. As soon as Manny got to Nelson's rest, they sent a hammock and four men. You were shaken about a good deal, though. But they did their best. Young Mr. Luttrell, 
rode alongside you all the way. Wasn't that kind? Yes, I said. She looked thin and old, and her hair wasn't arranged prettily, so I shut my eyes, not wanting to see her. Pierre is dead, isn't he? He died on the way down, the poor little boy, she said. He died before that, I thought, but was too tired to speak. Your mother is in the country, resting, getting well again. You will see her quite soon. I didn't know, I said. Why did she go away? You've been very ill for nearly six weeks. You didn't know anything. What was the use of telling her that I'd been awake before and heard my mother screaming, Kiela, Kiela, and then, Don't touch me. I'll kill you if you touch me. Coward, hypocrite, I'll kill you. I'd put my hands over my ears. Her screams were so loud and terrible. I slept, and when I woke up, everything was quiet. Still, Aunt Cora stayed by my bed, looking at me. My head is bandaged up. It is so hot, I said. Will I have a mark on my forehead? No, no. She smiled for the first time. That is healing very nicely. It won't spoil you on your wedding day, she said. She bent down and kissed me. Is there anything you want? A cool drink to sip? No, not a drink. Sing to me. I like that. She began in a shaky voice. Every night at half past eight comes tap. Tapping. Not that one. I don't like that one. Sing. Before I was set free. She sat near me and sang very softly. Before I was set free. I heard as far as the sorrow that my heart feels for. I didn't hear the end. But I heard that before I slept. The sorrow that my heart feels for. I was going to see my mother. I had insisted that Christophine must be with me, no one else. And as I was not yet quite well, they had given way. I remember the dull feeling as we drove along, for I did not expect to see her. She was part of Colibri that had gone so she had gone, I was certain of it. But when we reached the tidy, pretty little house where she lived now, they said, I jumped out of the carriage and ran as fast as I could across the lawn. One door was open onto the veranda. I went in without knocking and stared at the people in the room. A coloured man, a coloured woman and a white woman sitting with her head bent so low that I couldn't see her face. But I recognised her hair one plait much shorter than the other, and her dress. I put my arms round her and kissed her. She held me so tightly that I couldn't breathe, and I thought, it's not her. Then, it must be her. She looked at the door, then at me, then at the door again. I could not say he is dead, so I shook my head. But I am here, I am here, I said. And she said, no, quietly. Then, no, 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 very loudly and flung me from her. I fell against the partition and hurt myself. The man and the woman were holding her arms, and Christophine was there. The woman said, Why you bring the child to make trouble, trouble, trouble? Trouble enough without that. 
All the way back to Aunt Cora's house, we didn't speak. The first day I had to go to the convent, I clung to Aunt Cora as you would cling to life if you loved it. At last she got impatient, so I forced myself away from her and through the passage, down the steps, into the street, and, as I knew they would be, they were waiting for me under the sandbox tree. There were two of them, a boy and a girl. The boy was about fourteen and tall and big for his age. He had a white skin, a dull, ugly white, covered with freckles. His mouth was a negro's mouth, and he had small eyes like bits of green glass. He had the eyes of a dead fish. Worst, most horrible of all, his hair was crinkled, a negro's hair but bright red, and his eyebrows and eyelashes were red. The girl was very black and wore no head handkerchief. Her hair had been plaited, and I could smell the sickening oil she had daubed on it from where I stood on the steps of Aunt Cora's dark, clean, friendly house, staring at them. They looked so harmless and quiet. No one would have noticed the glint in the boy's eyes. Then the girl grinned and began to crack the knuckles of her fingers. At each crack I jumped and my hands began to sweat. I was holding some school books in my right hand and I shifted them to under my arm, but it was too late. There was a mark on the palm of my hand and a stain on the cover of the book. The girl began to laugh very quietly. And it was then that hate came to me and courage with the hate so that I was able to walk past without looking at them. I knew they were following. I knew too that as long as I was in sight of Aunt Cora's house they would do nothing but stroll along some distance after me. But I knew when they would draw close. It would be when I was going up the hill. There were walls and gardens on each side of the hill, and no one would be there at this hour of the morning. Halfway up, they closed in on me and started talking. The girl said, Look, the crazy girl. You crazy like your mother. Your aunt, Frightened to have you in the house? She sent you for the nuns to lock up? Your mother walked about with no shoes and stockings on her feet. She sang cool lot. She tried to kill her husband, and she tried to kill you too that day you go to see her. She have eyes like zombie, and you have eyes like zombie too. Why won't you look at me? The boy only said, One day I catch you alone, you wait. One day I catch you alone. When I got to the top of the hill, they were jostling me. I could smell the girl's hair. A long, empty street stretched away to the convent, the convent wall and a wooden gate. I would have to ring before I could get in. The girl said, you don't want to look at me, eh? I make you look at me. She pushed me, and the books I was carrying fell to the ground. I stooped to pick them up, and saw that a tall boy who was walking along the other side of the street had stopped and looked towards us. Then he crossed over, running. He had long legs. His feet hardly touched the ground. As soon as they saw him, they turned and walked away. He looked after them, puzzled. I would have died sooner than run when they were there. But as soon as they had gone, I ran. I left one of my books on the ground, and the tall boy came after me. You dropped this, he said and smiled. I knew who he was. His name was Sandy. Alexander Cosway's son. Once, I would have said, my cousin Sandy, but Mr. Mason's lectures had made me shy about my coloured relatives. I muttered, thank you. I'll talk to that boy, he said. He won't bother you again. 
In the distance I could see my enemy's red hair as he pelted along, but he hadn't a chance. Sandy caught him up before he reached the corner. The girl had disappeared. I didn't wait to see what happened, but I pulled and pulled at the bell. At last the door opened. The nun was a coloured woman, and she seemed displeased. You must not ring the bell like that, she said. I come as quick as I can. Then I heard the door shut behind me. I collapsed and began to cry. She asked me if I was sick, but I could not answer. She took my hand, still clicking her tongue and muttering in an ill-tempered way, and led me across the yard, past the shadow of the big tree, not into the front door, but into a big, cool, stone-flagged room. There were pots and pans hanging on the wall and a stone fireplace. There was another nun at the back of the room, and when the bell rang again, the first one went to answer it. The second nun, also a coloured woman, brought a basin and water, but as fast as she sponged my face, so fast did I cry. When she saw my hand, she asked if I had fallen and hurt myself. I shook my head, and she sponged the stain away gently. What is the matter? What are you crying about? What has happened to you? And still I could not answer. She brought me a glass of milk. I tried to drink it, but I choked. Oh, la, la, she said, shrugging her shoulders, and went out. When she came in again, a third nun was with her, who said in a calm voice, You have cried quite enough now. You must stop. Have you got a handkerchief? I remembered that I had dropped it. The new nun wiped my eyes with a large handkerchief, gave it to me and asked my name. Antoinette, I said. Of course, she said. I know, you are Antoinette Cosway, that is to say, Antoinette Mason. Has someone frightened you? Yes. Now look at me, she said. You will not be frightened of me. I looked at her. She had large brown eyes, very soft, and was dressed in white, not with a starched apron like the others had. The band round her face was of linen, and above the white linen a black veil of some thin material, which fell in folds down her back. Her cheeks were red. She had a laughing face and two deep dimples. Her hands were small, but they looked clumsy and swollen, not like the rest of her. It was only afterwards that I found out that they were crippled with rheumatism. She took me into a parlour, furnished stiffly with straight-backed chairs and a polished table in the middle. After she had talked to me, I told her a little of why I was crying and that I did not like walking to school alone. That must be seen to, she said. I will write to your aunt. Now Mother St. Justin will be waiting for you. I have sent for a girl who has been with us for nearly a year. Her name is Louise. Louise de Plana. If you feel strange, she will explain everything. Louise and I walked along a paved path to the classroom. There was grass on each side of the path, and trees, and shadows of trees, and sometimes a bright bush of flowers. She was very pretty, and when she smiled at me, I could scarcely believe I had ever been miserable. She said, we always call Mother St. Justin Mother Juice of a Lime. She's not very intelligent, poor woman. You will see. Quickly, while I can, I must remember the hot classroom. The hot classroom. The pitch pine desks. The heat of the bench striking up through my body, along my arms and hands. But outside, I could see cool blue shadow on a white wall. My needle is sticky and creaks as it goes in and out of the canvas. My 
needle is swearing, I whisper to Louise, who sits next to me. We are cross-stitching silk roses on a pale background. We can colour the roses as we choose, and mine are green, blue and purple. Underneath, I will write my name in fire red. Antoinette Mason, née Cosway. Mount Calvary Convent, Spanish Town, Jamaica, 1839. As we work, Mother St. Justin reads us stories from the lives of the saints. St. Rose, St. Barbara, St. Agnes. But we have our own saint, the skeleton of a girl of fourteen under the altar of the convent chapel. The relics. But how did the nuns get them out here? I ask myself. In a cabin trunk? Specially packed for the hold? How? But here she is. And Sint Innocenzia is her name. We do not know her story. She is not in the book. The saints we hear about were all very beautiful and wealthy. All were loved by rich and handsome young men. More lovely and more richly dressed than he had ever seen her in life. Joan's mother, St. Justine. She smiled and said, Here, Theophilus, is a rose from the garden of my spouse, in whom you did not believe. The rose he found by his side when he awoke has never faded. It still exists. Oh, but where? Where? And Theophilus was converted to Christianity, says Mother St. Justine, reading very rapidly now, and became one of the holy martyrs. She shuts the book with a clap and talks about pushing down the cuticles of our nails when we wash our hands. Cleanliness, good manners, and kindness to God's poor. A flow of words. It's her time of life, says Hélène de Plana. She cannot help it, poor old Justine. When you insult or injure the unfortunate or the unhappy, you insult Christ himself, and he will not forget, for they are his chosen ones. This remark is made in a casual and perfunctory voice, and she slides on to order and chastity, that flawless crystal that, once broken, can never be mended. Also deportment. Like everyone else, she has fallen under the spell of the Diplana sisters and holds them up as an example to the class. I admire them. They sit so poised and imperturbable while she points out the excellence of Miss Hélène's coiffure achieved without a looking-glass. Please, Hélène, tell me how you do your hair because when I grow up I want mine to look like yours. It's very easy. You comb it upwards like this and then push it a little forward like that and then you pin it here and there. Never too many pins. Yes, but Hélène, mine does not look like yours, whatever I do. Her eyelashes flickered. She turned away, too polite to say the obvious thing. We have no looking glass in the dormitory. Once I saw the new young nun from Ireland looking at herself in a cask of water, smiling to see if her dimples were still there. When she noticed me, she blushed, and I thought, now she will always dislike me. Sometimes it was Miss Hélène's hair, and sometimes Miss Germaine's impeccable deportment, and sometimes it was the care Miss Louise took of her beautiful teeth, and if we were never envious, they never seemed vain. Hélène and Germaine, a little disdainful, aloof perhaps, but Louise, not even that. She took no part in it as if she knew that she was born for other things. Hélène's brown eyes could snap. Germaine's grey eyes were beautiful, soft and cow-like. She spoke slowly, and unlike most Creole girls, was very even-tempered. It's easy to imagine what happened to those two, bar accidents. Ah, but Louise, her small waist, her thin brown hands... Her black curls, which smelled of vetiver, 
her high sweet voice singing so carelessly in chapel about death, like a bird would sing. Anything might have happened to you, Louise. Anything at all, and I wouldn't be surprised.' 